Hey, Welcome everybody. Back. We're back. Mash is all done. So it's lunch. <laughs> yep. Um, so, we're going to lift this. I don't think I've ever lifted this on just Instagram camera before. It's always oh. been YouTube. Yeah. Um, this is a super fun thing. You want to you show everyone what we're working with? Yeah, just zoom up here and check out the big, huge... Blocking tackle. Yeah. This thing decreases the... You're, you're going to have to say the percentage because I still can't figure it out. It decreases the weight that we're going to lift by... 75%. So, I no 100 pounds would be 25 pounds. It is amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, so I actually have to um, get into this thing. So, there's a pivot point there so that it doesn't um like go yes. when you pull it out smart yeah that was reads engineer all right and oatmeal so i'll hook it up but you can do it because it's fun okay I know it's I like a tangle of things always. All right, here we go. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Hey, uh, the ball on me right there. And you can lower it. Okay. And it'll sit there. Boom. Sit. Brilliant. Ooh, I love that. You don't even have to tie it off. You just got a little hook so it rests right down on there. Oh, I know. Even if you don't want to use these, you can just tie it off and it'll just hang there. Yeah. It's great. It's great. This should drain relatively quickly since nice. it's only a five gallon batch. Yeah. All right. Well, while this drains, um, let's, oh, we can take a pre-boil, but I like doing that after it's all drainy. Um, but I'm going to turn the heat up to boil. Yes. All right. So that's going to sit there. And now we can measure copies. Sweet. Oh, and you know, I'm looking at the recipe here, Sarah. You thought that this goes in at 15 minutes. This is actually a whirlpool for 15 minutes. Aye, aye, aye. So we have no boil hops, no boil additions on this recipe. Here's some mosaic. All right. We're probably going to need some more. I have more. Well, it's only half an ounce on this one. It will be two ounces for the dry hop, which we are going to do actually today as a shortcut. It's like I got, I've just got every friggin' hop open at this point. <laughs> That's what happens. Alright. Rip this quick up a little bit here. The starter looks like it's finally doing some stuff. Yep. Put a little bit of froth in there. Yes, yeah, I started it last night at like six. I don't know what's going on. It's taking so long. Might have been a little hot when I put it in, so yeah, I added more good. of the same yeast this morning. All right, there we go. We got half an ounce of each in here. We're going to get a little cool hops. I guess I only needed one. Yeah, I just put them together. Uh, do you want to go ahead addition. and do the do other the other ones too while we got the hops sure. out? Yeah. Why don't you tell them a little bit about how we're going to alter our dry hopping? Smart. Um, so we both hate dry hopping. Uh, so. I totally do. I really hate it. It's like, <laughs> I always forget to do it too. That's it. Um, yeah. It's like, if it's not happening today, it's not happening at all. Um, so what we're going to do is actually dry hop today. So um, we're, when we throw in the yeast, we're going to throw in the dry hops as well. And... Yeah, people think that um, will give you some like bio transformation because like when you're in high Krausen, the hops will be there and something about that is supposed to like change the molecules. I don't know. I've never really noticed a difference, honestly. Yeah, I haven't really tested it too intently. Uh, I'm sure there is some difference out there and I'm sure y'all could look it up and I'm sure there's people out there that have done yeah. some I, intensiveness yeah. on it, but... Uh, I think Brewlosophy probably has a couple articles about it. Um, they usually do. They've got everything. Yeah. I mean, if you were in, I would say if you were doing, like I brew five gallons and I ferment in like an eight gallon bucket, so I'll have six and a half gallons. So I don't have a ton of headspace. So I probably wouldn't do it that way. 
uh, just because you do get kind of a little bit more of a blow off situation. Oh, there is you know, stuff that you can add though. This stuff I just got into. Oh, um, yeah, the, the Fomax or Firm Cap stuff. Yeah. So um, I got this because when I got my pressure system for that brew built, um, they suggested it. So, uh, you know, I've never really had like a blow off problem, right. but uh, when you're doing stuff under pressure, it's kind of a dicey situation, I guess. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe we just throw some of this in there. Sweet. It's just like food grade silicone is yeah. like the only ingredient. Yeah, and you just put it in like one little drop yeah. and it does the whole batch. It's amazing. Yeah. I've started using it for my starters because I have a consistent problem with like boil overs because they do them in the flask and oh, uh, totally, totally. it's amazing. I feel like it takes longer to boil though, which is weird, but it's probably just because I'm staring at it. Yeah, right, which we all know the axiom. Uh -huh. A boiled starter, or watch starter never boils. Seriously. All right, all right, okay, we got so our we hops. Got hops. Um, we can actually probably pull this Yeah, this screen. guy's looking pretty good. Yeah, that, yep. that, that drains real nice and quick. Mm. There's definitely still some stuff in there. Usually if you put it at an angle, it'll drain faster. There you go, yep. Yep, still hearing some heavy drops for mm -hmm. sure. What are we at? It's hard to tell. We're like right at six gallon. Okay. Is there a um, pre boil volume on there? No. Mm. No, I'll End of boil, it's supposed to be six gallons. Okay. Oh, boil size oh, six and a half. We there might need go. to add, we All can right. just add water now. Yeah, let's, totally. Honestly. Um, let's take a I was going to say, let's take a gravity reading. reading before and after. Like a little dropper. I don't know why it is, but I, droppers are like the one thing that I can it's never. Syringe work, probably. Yeah, but it's got sanitizer oh, okay. usually. Gotcha. I'm just going to use like white for cool. I wish I had. Oh, can you hand me that towel? There you go. Oh, we fixed. I knew I brought it out here for some reason. Yeah, if you guys haven't used refractometers before, these are a really handy little device that will read the gravity without having to alter the temperature. Um, most of us homebrewers are used to using hydrometers in a jar to read gravity, but you can certainly do that. Um, but when you're at this stage, <laughs> You have to kind of put it in the freezer or the fridge, let it come to temperature and be at room temp before you can get an accurate reading. Um, this is literally how I do it. I'm a mess all the time. Hey, man, you use the tools you got on hand. Yeah. So literally, you just put that on there. Yeah, let it sit for it like 30 seconds. Yep. Kind this one's like, I, I just got this one, and it's like a little less. It needs more on it than my other one for some oh, reason. Okay. I think the thing is like just higher. Yeah, it's usually weird. the little plastic okay. thing will spread it out nicely. Yeah, that and... one's, it's, it's going. All right. All right. So we're at 11.6 bricks. A little over 1.045. Okay. Want. Oh, we can actually show, show you guys. Um, it works like that sometimes. Oh, cool. Yeah, look. Uh, 1.046, so original gravity should be. Oh, so yeah, we should add some more. 1.048. Bird's eye view. So what are we at? 1.046? Uh, seven. Okay. I always like to put it in like a refractometer calculator though, because okay. I don't trust it yeah. because people on the internet told me not to trust it. How much, um, when you get boil off, do you get a decent amount of additional with gravity this, out of this? With this, it's, it's ridiculous. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it bumps it's up quite a bit core. from your pre-boil. Okay. should add some So we can add that sure. water and not have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Me brewing with my grandfather, I get almost no additional. Yeah. With the 110 yeah. on this, but yeah. because this is a 240, yeah. it's like out, yeah. out of control. Yeah. So that's, we're talking about the, vi the vigorousness of the boil. Essentially you're going to have say 6.75 gallons starting. You boil it for an hour. And you know you see steam coming off right and that's water evaporating out so it's going to condense your liquid down and that's going to make the gravity which measures the density of sugar in your liquid it's going to make it go up um, so when we're looking for a final gra or excuse me an original gravity after the boil of 1.048 and our gravity 1 is 1.49 okay yeah i just did the calculator okay. so she says that in her system she gets a really rigorous boil that's going to go probably closer to what 1.055 or something like that probably yeah, i can do a like boil off calculator or like that. um and since we're a little bit low on volume as it is here boil size we're estimates 6.5 this says six so we're going to add a half a gallon 
It's going to bring that gravity down. Yeah. So when we compress the liquid after boil off, we should hit that gravity a little bit closer. So let's uh, crank up this hose. I'm wondering if I have like a, oh, here. Let's just keep it there and we can just use this guy. This is like, a uh, I think this might be half a gallon actually. <laughs> All right, what are we at now? We, yeah, that was about half. Oh, you can do it. Here, actually, let's do it over this because I got to clean this anyway. I love that. Dump it on there. Concrete floors are a godsend. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I've been in the kitchen. My wife wouldn't like that. <laughs> so we're at about uh, 10.3 bricks. Let me pull up the calculator. Oh, the bricks one, huh? Well, it has both, but oh, bricks both. is supposed to be um, better. I don't know, man. Yeah, we're looking at like 10.42. Yeah, it's actually pretty accurate, honestly. Cool. All right, so yeah, that dropped us down from 4.9 to 4.2. Uh, so if you get a generally about six points extra out, we're going to hit that 10.48 probably pretty darn close. Yeah. So. Can we stop green, please? All right. And you know, when it comes to hitting your numbers, you're not ruining your beer. You're not doing anything wrong if you don't hit your numbers. Um, you can always add water to bring it down. It's more difficult to bring it up, um, but you can add some extract if you have that on hand um, or some, D, you know, either LME or DME. DME. Um, there you go. And that can raise your, your numbers as well. Um, it's just going to determine, you know, because often your, the amount of hops you've decided for that recipe is in relation to what your gravity is and what the end ABV is going to be. Um, so if your ABV or gravity is significantly different than your target, it is going to alter a little bit that hop um, representation in your final beer. So you can always play by ear, but you know what? You never do it wrong because you're going to make a beer that you're going to learn from. So do what you can to, yeah. to fix it or not, but either, just learn from the experience. Either going to be hoppier or sweeter. Yeah. Not, exactly. Not that big of a deal. Exactly. You're making a pale ale might be an IPA. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It does ride that line. Just don't tell anyone what you're making before you taste it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me tell you, I'm a BJCP judge, and our axiom is enter the beer for the category you made, not for the category you intended to make. Seriously. Um, so as a brewer, if you're entering your beers in a competition, it'd be very valuable for you to be good at tasting your beer, understanding styles, and being like, okay, I intended to make an amber ale, but really this is a brown ale. And if I enter it as a brown ale, I'm going to have a far better chance of hitting those marks and having a better score, better chance of meddling, etc. So um, as a BJCP judge, I see that quite often and we will have a really great beer and I know. be like, oh my God, this beer, if it was in this category, it we would be sending great. it on. Yeah. Um, but we have to score it based on the style that it was entered in and we will always put at the bottom like, hey man, you made a really great beer. Please consider putting it into this category next time around. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the difference between an amber and a brown? Since you mentioned it. Yeah, I mean, well, one of all, I mean, American brown or English brown, there's differences there, right? So that's going to be ABV and uh, yeast. Obviously, you'd be using English yeast. yeast. Um, but the amber and the brown is pretty close. Your amber is generally not going to have any roasted malt in it. Um, but your brown can have a little bit of roasted malt flavor in there. Um, gotcha. So to me, that's kind of one of the major differences. Generally, you use an amber, a, your caramel malt is what's giving you that color. There you go. Yeah. All right. Uh, the, that's oil. Like, yeah, seriously. Yeah. It's one of those that thing just style works. comparisons. I'm always like, I know I don't love brown ales, but I really like ambers, and I just never looked it up. Yeah. I love brown ales. And it breaks my heart that they are not nearly made or appreciated in the craft beer world, but that's part of why I'm a home brewer, so that I can make yeah. the beers that other people don't make that I love. So I was talking to my buddy who's a brewer in Asheville, and he was like, yeah, man, it's like so hard to find a good brown on tap. Yep. Have you been to McLeod? 
No. Mm -mm. That's where you need to go. Okay. They're an uh, English style brewery. Yes, great. They're Love amazing. It. Love it. Okay. Yeah, so many craft breweries started out as English style originally, um, mm -hmm. back in the 90s, you know? Yeah. And then that kind of became, no, we don't want to do that. We want to move on to cooler things. But yeah. it feels like English is getting its time again, so yeah. I appreciate that. Their ESB is my all-time favorite beer. Oh man, ESB it's, is fantastic. Well, I say that about a lot of beers, yeah. as people <laughs> probably mentioned because I just said that about Le Femme But like, at a brewery that I can go to, that's my favorite yes. beer. Awesome. I go there just for that beer. I don't ever order anything That's else. great. Yeah, I had a fresh hot ESB recently, Ooh. and that was so wonderful. That's what I really love about the Portland beer scene these days. Um, one, we're right next to Yakima Valley, so we get the fresh hops. Um, but it's not just, let's make a fresh hop IPA. People are making fresh hop Kolsch's and fresh hop Pilsner's oh, and fresh ESBs. Hop Kolsch sounds so nice. Oh, man. Oh, Zoigel House, fresh so hop refreshing. Kolsch. Amazing. Oh, it was, I could just poo, 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 pound them. <laughs> How's that grain, bird mm. dog? Huh? My favorite. Brewdog approves. She'll stick her head in there and just like, I gotta keep Start her from going to town. Like, yeah, it's hot. It's hot, kid. So much fiber. That's awesome. Okay, so like we said, we have no boil additions of hops for this guy. Um, the first time I saw a recipe like that, I was like, wait, how does that, how does that work, right? Because I know. you learn, like you have a 60 minute addition for bittering. And uh, the first beer I ever saw that on was, um, Pelican Brewing in Oregon, Kawanda Cream Ale, which is like one of my desert island beers. Like I uh, could drink this beer for the rest of my life. And it's been around for like 20 years. Yeah. It's won 15 gold medals and they are a no hop. They only do Whirlpool. The, the thing that's funny when you do like the only Whirlpool or the only dry hop is your IBUs are so just like on the opposite end of what you would consider like a pale ale or an IPA. So like the IBU on this is 6.7. Typically like, like there's some West Coast, like technically your palate can only taste up to a hundred IBUs, but a lot of um, IPAs are in like the 50, 60, 70 range. And uh, it's just funny. You, you really have to like modify your recipe and just like, trust yourself when you're yeah. making these because the yeah. calculator is not going to save you on this one and i looked for a dry hop calculator for correct ibus doesn't exist yeah i think they're it's, slowly beginning yeah. to catch up mm -hmm. um because they are realizing that the isomerization you get from late edition and whirlpool is actually far greater than they ever thought yeah um but yeah you're right it is to taste and to experience how how you manage that so we know that we had a really great uh resource help us devise this homebrew version of this so we can trust that they knew what they were talking about it was jen blair right ash yeah jen blair under the jen fluence she's absolutely yeah. amazing she's yeah. on the board of the aha um she did an amazing bjcp judge training course just recently for women to try to get women further into bjcp judging Love it was it. so awesome it was like 18 weeks of like an hour session every single week wow it was so cool that's awesome um, yeah. yeah so she's she's rad she's and a the, great homebrewer the socal super sarah has also helped out oh yeah oh yeah scc yeah. They're a really great homebrew club, yep. man. Um, My they homebrew work club. hard to the diversity angle, right? Too. Oh, yeah. It's something they put front and center. And um, are always striving to increase their diversity, even though they are a hugely diverse club. Right. When that's, to me, is a big difference. Mm -hmm. I was a member of a club who, said, who pretty much kind of like, well, we had a black president once, so now we're good. Um, and I'm sorry, that's not the way it works, y'all. You got to keep pressing. You got to keep doing better every single year, every single day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. We will be wrapping up here soon. And yeah. we'll talk to you soon. Hey, hey everybody. Welcome back. Yeah, y'all. Our boil is over. Our boil has been over for a hot minute. Yeah. And it boiled too much. So we added some water. It's all good. Yeah. Just like we told you we would probably. She's got the ripping 240 heat coil on there and, uh, we got down to five gallons, four gallons, four gallons. Jeez. Um, yeah. And our 
Gravity was at like 1065 or something like that. So yeah. we're aiming for a 1048. And of course, we want a five gallon batch. So we added in about another gallon and a half yeah. fish. In the, we ran the pump a bit. And in the kettle right now is five gallons. And in the lines, usually is about quarter to a half gallon. So, yeah. yeah so, all good. All right. So, we're going to use this super fun thing called a hangover. It's by X. Chillerator, and this basically makes a whirlpool when you don't have like it's like a whirlpool attachment so it's just going to spin the wort at the bottom when we put our hops in and let them sit for 15 minutes at 180 degrees right we're going to toss the hops in at 190 though and then just kind of let it cool itself down yeah yeah because with this thing at 180 it'll probably start boiling it <laughs> Right? It's such a monster. So yeah. We just we'll turned it off ride. totally. Yeah. All right. You know, that's great because, man, cool. in my grandfather, I don't even have the attachment. I just like, just I get it going. I would just good. like let it sit, like whatever. <laughs> you know, I only get it going for like two minutes, though. Like, that's good enough. Yeah, right. All right. So, in theory. I don't know if it's actually going to make it swirl swirl, but we're at 195 now. This shouldn't take long. You know, when you have like a ton of volume, it, it like, you don't really see it okay. happen like that, but this is pretty cool. Nice. Well, it's good to know. I'm doing it on a smaller batch, so you know it's still moving down there, even if you don't see it up on the surface. Totally. Yeah, All that right. seems way easier than the paddle on the end of the drill, and you got to stand there for eight minutes. I know, right? And, yeah. Yeah, That's it awesome. just like hooks up to the same pump we're gonna hook to the um plate chiller. Yeah. Well it already is hooked to the plate. Oh, yeah, it's actually going sure. through the plate chiller sure, right yeah. now. The plate chiller doesn't have any water in it though. But um Yeah, that's great because at about 195, 200 degrees, it's gonna sanitize that plate chiller for you too for you Heck yeah. Get your cool ward in there, so that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. So we're just gonna toss in our hops. Uh half a ounce of Sabro and Mosaic. For 15 minutes? Yep. That's it. Done. Right? <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> Super fast. All right. Uh, uh, so actually set a timer. Yes. And so now we just need to hook up the um, plate chiller to the water and clean and sanitize the fermenter since it's been sitting for like a billion years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It literally lives next to a trash can, which is a good sign. Sarah, is there anything you would like to talk about? Upcoming videos and stuff? Nope. Do you wanna I don't want anyone to expect anything from me. Because <laughs> I'm behind. So you don't want to talk about the podcast. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Coming into the last segment here. We have our wort at about 170. It has finished its 15 minutes of whirlpooling with our hops. And so we are now ready to transfer, chill and transfer to yeah. our sanitized fermenter. Yep. Yep. Um, so we're going to pump system. We're going to circulate it back into here just because I don't okay. trust how cold our groundwater is. Okay. Um, and then once this reads uh, 75, sure, um, we can pitch our yeast and then or transfer, pitch our yeast, and then... This will get hooked up to the glycol because it does get really warm in here. Um, and we're going to add our hops too. Oh shit, yeah. Forgot about that. <laughs> uh, we should put those in a hop bag at least. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's, that that one's got a hole in it. I don't know why I haven't thrown that one away yet. <laughs> Just can't bring myself to do it. Bags in bags. Oh, in yeah. more bags. That's the best. Here's one. I have a very elaborate bag in bag system. That's too big. Oh, that's huge. Where are all my small bags? I think you actually have one here. Oh, yeah? Oh, 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 Oops, yep. Back oh. down. We That's a big one. one. That one, one, yeah, that one doesn't have a hole in it. I'm going to just throw away the whole one. Okay. <laughs> I don't like doing that. All right. It's a cool okay. if I spritz it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to sanitize this bad boy because it is going into our chilled wort. If work. you want to, um, it'll... Oh, it'll do spray. Yeah, it'll do a mist. That's a little better. Cool. Right. Anything touching chill more it needs to be sanitized. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn on the... Sanitizing is safe, so it's not going to hurt you. On the hose, so we can actually get this puppy moving. Oh. 
just going to set this in here for now. And we'll fill it up in a minute. Sometimes when I turn on the hose, because I throw it in the pool, and the, the hose head will land on the top step, and it will create a fountain. It's insane. <laughs> hey, free water feature. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> come up over the side and, like, hit the dog. We're at 100. All right. We're at 100 now, so we're going to let that chill out a little bit more. Um, you want to talk a little bit about why you do starters? Sure. Let me tell you. Yeah, you've got a nice little yeast fridgy. My bank. Yeah. Um. It's so. Lab going. I am very cheap. Is the reason <laughs> I make starters. Yeah. Um. So, uh, what I've started doing, and I've always saved my yeast, but basically every batch I just keep the yeast from because, like, screw it, I don't want to buy more yeast. Yeah. Yeast is expensive. Yeah. Um, so I've started just kind of keeping samples of yeast from my previous batches in here. And um, when I'm ready to brew beer, I grow a starter. Uh, starter basically just increases the cell count um, in your sample, essentially, so that you can actually brew a whole beer with something this size, saved from a previous one. And uh, I only started doing this because I was running out of space. Yes. <laughs> Is normally you save them yeah. in jars. Yeah, yeah, like, like that's my it. that's my non-transferred yet <laughs> setup. Um, but yeah, I mean yeah. you can get. I think that's my Lafindis, my Lafin yeast actually. Um, but yeah, I mean you can use reuse yeast up to like about ten times um, per. Uh, I actually keep a couple samples, so technically I can make ten samples per ten batches per sample, and just kind of keep the strain alive, keep it healthy. I've also got a microscope somewhere that I haven't used yet, but uh, that's cool. I'm really that's excited really to start cool. cell yeah. counting. I'm yeah. like totally nerding out on it. Yeah, that's so fun. But yeah, yeah, so um, even if yeah. you only want to buy like, like technically if you're buying like liquid yeast, you're supposed to be using two packs, which like, is asinine, I think, that they don't just sell them in usable batches. Um, but you can always create a starter if you don't think you're gonna have enough or if you have old yeast, or like, you know, you accidentally went to the homebrew store, left your yeast out on your counter for a week, and then are like, oh crap, it's completely inflated. <laughs> like a starter. Yeah. You're gonna be fine. Yeah, be exactly. Fine. You'd separate out those dead cells and the, and the healthy ones will keep going for you. Hell yeah. yeah. I will put out a little pitch though for Imperial Yeast because they're the local, they're the local yeast company up in Portland. They also supported Women's International Beer Summit this year. I know the folks over there, they're really awesome. Um, and they actually do sell their packs around 200 billion cell counts. Yeah. So it's it like, is a single pack starter. It's them and yeah. like usually the dry yeast. Yes. You get that many, but yeah. Not to yeah. throw anyone under the bus, but some yeast companies only give you enough for like, uh, what, it's like 5%, yeah. five gallon batch. But mm -hmm. like, you know, we're homebrewers. We like, we like strong beer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so. So props out to those companies. Yeah. Yeah. I think we could probably transfer it in and it'll be in the 70s by the time it gets in there. All right. It's, Sounds it's good. still dropping. So. Yeah, and for sure. Yeah. That's the benefit of those plate chillers. You don't really have to cool down the entire batch all at the same time. Yeah. And um, the, another benefit of using a glycol system is like, you know, it's gonna get cooled down anyway. You'll get down. Um, we have that sanitizer. Quick. Yeah, and again, we're on the cold side now, is what they call it. So we want to sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. I have concrete floors. Don't worry about my floors. <laughs> I just like don't. Oh care. yeah, I spray. Oh, everywhere. I just spray sanitizer as much as needed. Everything wipes up off the floor. I know. I'm like, it's probably sanitizing the floor at this rate. It's fine. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so I just like to drape this in, kind of keep it above. So um, one thing I don't do is I don't aerate my wort. Gotcha. Um, yeah. I just let it fall. Yeah, fall. Yep. Works. Yeah. Works great. Yeah, and you'll see you'll have lots of bubbles. Um, plus, with doing a starter, it's not nearly as necessary yeah. to aerate fully because aeration, oxygen, one time you want to put that in is before you pitch your yeast. And that's really for healthy cell growth and you've done a whole lot of the cell growth already in your starter so yeah doing it the way she's doing it more than sufficient yeah i would say if you're doing a super big batch um and big i mean starting gravity not quantity 
um, and a big imperial stout that's going to be 10 or 12 percent or something like that, you certainly want to hit it with some oxygen. Yeah. yeah. The yeasts uh, need oxygen to grow their cell walls. So if you don't have oxygen, like this is the only time you want oxygen in your beer, yes. um, then they can't grow without it. So yeah. Most of the flavors you get in a beer where you're like, oh, oh that doesn't taste so good. That's usually coming from either not proper sanitation or unhealthy yeast. Yep. So we just want to make the yeast as happy as we possibly can. They're the coolest organisms on the planet, man. They are. Humanity would not be what it is without the yeast. Uh, I was talking to someone and they mentioned something about yeast, but they said that yeast is the, it's the uh, most successful organism on earth. I would imagine that's true. Yeah, I mean, it's everywhere, yeah. if you think about it. We're a little under five. All right. Yeah, which is understandable, because we have five going in. Actually, once we put the yeast starter, mm -hmm. or at least some of the yeast starter, we will, um, yeah. I thought we were going to make 10 gallons and then change my mind last minute. Perfect. All right, and she goes. Sure, five. <laughs> yeah, we know it'll fit in the keg. All right. All right, locking her up. Yeah, it's almost nice when you do like exactly a five gallon batch because you know you're not going to overshoot your keg and oh, then yeah, have it explode no, everywhere. No, yeah. Alrighty. No, it's always a conundrum when you have nice finished beer and you're like, I have to get rid yeah. of it. Do you want to just push that table out of the way? It's on wheels. Yes. Yes. Perfect. That's why everything's on wheels. All right. So I'm hooking up my glycol. With my quick releases. Um, so I need to make a blow off actually. That's what that was for. Ah, yes. uh, <laughs> um, I'm actually just gonna do a blow off from something else. Yeah, if you guys have ever done tours of like commercial breweries, you'll often see the big conical fermenters, stainless steel fermenters. And very often you'll see a big hose coming out into a bucket and you'll see it bubbling away. A lot of home brewers use just an airlock and that helps let it bubble out, but you can use a blow up tube. That way, if you get a particularly rigorous fermentation, that excess yeast will just come through that tube, go into your sanitized area there, and it won't, it won't cause any problems for you. It's actually 76 in there. Sweet. Not bad. All right. Cool. Yeah, that should keep the yeast happy, and we'll get down to temp soon, and... We made beer. And in about two weeks. You generally do a full two weeks for every ale you do. Unless I do it under pressure, but yeah. 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 It'll go into a keg in two weeks. Well, thanks to everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Sarah, for having me. Yeah. It was really fun getting to hang out in your brew house. Yeah, it was great to have you. Yeah. I'm glad you're in town. This was yeah. fun. Yeah, it worked out really well. Um, so thanks again, y'all, and uh, look for some further videos coming soon. We love you guys. Bye.